Hello everyone, welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Today I'm going to be looking at a poem by D. H. Lawrence, David Herbert Lawrence. Um, and I want to look at how D. H. Lawrence plays with rhyme patterns in the, the poem's form. So I'm going to be looking at form and rhyme. And the reason why I'm looking today at D. H. Lawrence is because of a comment left by Furiosa Ning, thank you very much indeed, uh, asking for a video that looked at D. H. Lawrence's form and methods. So do please comment if you're interested in something in particular that you'd like me to have a look at. Do please like the video and remember to subscribe if you like what I do here on my channel. So the poem I'm going to be looking at is called Autumn Rain. The plain leaves fall black and wet on the lawn. The cloud sheaves in heaven's fields set droop and are drawn in falling seeds of rain. The seed of heaven on my face falling. I hear again like echoes even that softly pace heaven's muffled floor. The winds that tread out all the grain of tears, the store harvested in the sheaves of pain caught up aloft. The sheaves of dead men that are slain now winnowed soft on the floor of heaven, manner invisible of all the pain here to us given, finely divisible, falling as rain. I'm going to start off by thinking about the form of the poem and introducing some sort of terms that we associate with modernism, which is the kind of literary period that D. H. Lawrence was writing in, and how we can think about the way that form can evolve and change and how it can evolve one work can evolve over the course of an author's life and what that might tell us about the kind of progress of an author's thinking. So the poem Autumn Rain was first published in a magazine called The Egoist, fabulously named The Egoist, uh, in February 1917. Uh, so it, the poem was written and published then during the First World War. And you can see that there is a, a sort of elision, there is um, a comparison made within the poem between the kind of harvesting process of autumn and the, 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 the death of these men. So we've got the, the sheaves uh, and sheaves is a, a sheaf, sheaves is part of the kind of harvesting process. It's a bundle of grain stalks that are sort of laid lengthways and then tied together after after reaping. Um, also, uh, later down in the poem, now winnowed soft, winnowing is another kind of harvesting term. It's separating the wheat from the chaff. Um, so the, the kind of the, the light from the heavy, uh, what you want from what you don't want, what you want to keep and what you want to discard. So there's a comparison that Lawrence is making between the harvesting of the harvest bread, uh, as it's said in, in this version of the poem, and the sheaves of, of grain um, and the, the kind of the chaff of the dead men, the chaff, you know, the, the kind of discarded men of the war. And this comparison is made particularly explicit in the line, the sheaves of dead men. So there's a kind of explicit comparison there between the sheaves of, of, of grain, of wheat, uh, and, and the sheaves of dead men, these kind of harvested dead men. The poem Autumn Rain was then somewhat uh, edited, somewhat 
uh, reworked and published in Lawrence's Collected Poems, which were published uh, over a decade later in 1928. And I think it's worth putting these two versions of the poem side by side from almost a decade apart and looking at the visual difference between the two. So when you're analysing literature and your or poetry in particular and you're interested in form, do pay attention to different versions of the same poem because it can be quite revealing about an author's uh, progress or about kind of fashions um, in literature and how authors can kind of conform perhaps to literary expectations of the period in which they're writing. And this I think is, a, this poem is a good example of seeing that movement between the earlier poem and the later one. So the earlier version from 1917, the poem on the left, looks far more structured, looks far more contained than the version on the right. And I want to think a bit more about how that, or it's interesting to think about how that informs your understanding of the poem and how you read the poem and what you think then the poem might mean. So, in terms of the layout then, the poem does look visually very different. First, the offset opening lines. I think this is the kind of most obvious difference, that each stanza, each verse is quite clearly demarcated because it has the, the sort of indent of the subsequent lines. So you really kind of notice the first the first word in each, the first line, first word in each stanza, in each verse, and then the final line as well. So falling as rain is offset again. Sort of demarcating it as being different in some way from, from the rest. The capitalization also makes a difference, I think, because it sort of encourages you to read to the end of the line and then start almost like a new sentence. You know, we're kind of conditioned when you see a capital to think of it in some ways as being a new sentence. So I think it encourages you to read to the end of the line and then think of each, the beginning of the next line as a, as a new thought or a new kind of section. And that's less encouraged in the version on the right, where there is not the capitalization at the beginning of each line or indeed at the beginning of each verse of each uh, stanza. So not only are you encouraged to kind of roll over the lines, the plain leaves fall black and wet on the lawn, but you're also then encouraged to read over, over the stanzas, uh, you know, on my face falling, for example. And that's important if you're if you're thinking about the kind of content and or it has been said that this is a poem obviously that that is about rain and therefore the form if you're looking at the later poems form seems to encourage that idea of of falling because you kind of read over the lines at like a sort of continual uh, patter of rain that keeps on going over the lines that it's not sort of regimented it's not broken up it, it keeps pouring it keeps falling um also, I think it's worth just noting that the stanzas are more divided, yes, by the first lines on the in the version on the left, but also actually the space between the stanzas is bigger. Um, the stanzas are much less clearly demarcated in the later version. Again, perhaps encouraging this thought of it being more free flowing, of it being slightly freer, slightly less regimented, slightly less kind of contained and uh, uh, limited, you might say, as we'll get on to have a look at in Lawrence's own words. So actually, I think these poems do look quite different, even though they are essentially 
the same poem. There are not that many changes between the early version and the late version in terms of the content, um, as you can see here. There are a few differences. So cloud sheaves is hyphenated in the earlier version. It's not in the later one. Um, strewn. So these these um, cloud sheaves are strewn in the earlier version. They're drawn in the later one over my face, later on my face. Um, perhaps a more significant change of harvest bread becomes harvested. And if we're thinking about these men being kind of harvested, then that change might play into that uh, interpretation. From the sheaves of gain, we have in the earlier version and in the later version, in the sheaves of pain. And that is perhaps a, a significant difference moving from the sheaves of gain of bread harvested uh, of harvest bread being a gain to these men being harvested um, and the sheaves of pain. So there is a bit of a difference difference there um, and their pain. So men and their pain and later it becomes men that are slain. A more kind of explicit a reference, I think, to the you know horrors of World War One, perhaps because they only became known later, or perhaps because it, you know Lawrence particularly felt um, the idea that they were slain uh, more later. Um, from the floor of heaven, on the floor of heaven, uh, and then later from the floor of heaven here to us given, and I think that is another important. Uh, change because it's bringing us readers and us the speaker sort of into this poem as well. It's not just about um, the men and the grain um, and the comparison between being on the floor, the chaff being on the floor and the men being on the floor. Um, it's also about um, here to us given. So, um, you know, the, the, the pain being kind of shared a bit more. Um, amongst us readers speaker and the men within the poem so yes there are differences and i don't have time to go fully into all of them today um, but in terms of what i'm interested in today in terms of the rhyme it is essentially the same poem even though formally it looks very different an important uh, term, literary term, to think about in relation to modernism, and it's often associated with uh, D.H. Lawrence's uh, poetry, uh, particularly his, his later poetry, um, and that's free verse. Um, and this is the Oxford English Dictionary's definition. So free verse they define as poetic writing in which the traditional rules of prosody, especially those of metre and rhyme, and rhyme is what I'm interested in today, are disregarded in favour of variable rhythms and line lengths and um, often a kind of lack of rhyme or a very um, kind of sporadic uh, use of rhyme in which sometimes it comes very much to the foreground and sometimes it's kind of blank free verse, not rhyming at all. Um, and a particular uh, example of this often cited as you know, a kind of exemplar of 20th century modernist free verse uh, was published in 1922. So between the two poems that were uh, the two versions of the same poem that we're looking at, Autumn Rain. Um, and that's T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which was a kind of uh, groundbreaking fundamental uh, poem, uh, particularly in its demonstration, its use of free verse, sometimes using kind of popian couplets and uh, sometimes not using rhyme at all. So I want to think about what D.H. Lawrence then says about free verse and how he compares it to rhymed verse. So this is from his preface to his new poems uh, which was published in uh, 1920 and this preface is sometimes called uh, his essay on the poetry of the present and in it he writes give me nothing fixed set static and I think it kind of immediately 
you can perhaps see why this poem Autumn Rain moved from its form of the 1917 version into its later form. The earlier version looks just immediately when you first look at it more fixed, more set, more static. And that's what I was talking about, about rain moving through the stanzas, through the lines, that feeling of freedom rather than this feeling of being fixed and set which you might take from the earlier form of the poem, even though the content is it's largely similar, the same. And D.H. Lawrence continues then, much has been written about free verse, but all that can be said first and last is that free verse is or should be direct utterance from the instant whole man. It is the soul and the mind and body surging at once, nothing left out. They all they speak all together. There is some confusion, some discord, but the confusion and the discord only belong to the reality as noise belongs to the plunge of water. It is no use inventing fancy laws for free verse. So here we're beginning to think about he's beginning to think about fancy laws for poetry. No use drawing a melodic line which all the feet must tow. So I've spoken elsewhere about poetic lines being feet and you having a heel and a toe and a heel and a toe and a heel and a toe, heel 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 toe, which is iambic pentameter, which is often thought of as being the rhythm that's most like natural English speech patterns. But Lawrence here is kind of using that imagery of metrical feet and the idea that, you know, if you have a heel, then you want that toe and saying, you know, he, he doesn't he doesn't want to draw that melodic line in which all the feet have, must have have a toe, have this kind of satisfying um, did dum did dum did dum did dum did dum um, And also talking, of course, about towing the line. So free verse toes no melodic line no matter what drill sergeant. So it's talking about um, sort of formed rhyme then as being sort of military, you know, master and uh, servant, that sort of relationship of authority and um, uh, rigidity. Walt Whitman so he's an American poet, pruned away his cliches, perhaps his cliches of rhythm as well as of phrase. And this is about all we can do deliberately with free verse. So it's pruning away conventions, getting rid of them all, or cliches of poetry in Lawrence's own terms. We can get rid of the stereotyped movements. Um, and stereotype there is um, not just when you talk about a stereotype being a sort of um, convention or, uh, a, you know, the, just thinking in a very kind of uh, prescribed way about something. Stereotype there is from the original um, printing process, which was um, used on printing presses where you would at literally have to take a kind of stereotype in order to make other prints. So that was how you took your your original type to make your to use in your printing press to get the first one. You'd then have to kind of mold that original one so that you could use it on a different one. And that's how you got multiple versions originally. So there would be a stereotype. Um, so we can get rid of the stereotype movement. So he's very much deliberately there drawing attention to um, the customs of literature, the sort of physical, practical customs of making literature uh, and the old hackneyed associations of sound or sense. So here I think we, we can see an influence, an echo of Alexander Pope, the old hackneyed associations of sound or sense. And that's his kind of classic phrase, Alexander Pope's classic phrase from an essay on criticism, which I've also spoken about elsewhere, of the sound must seem an echo to the sense. Um, so the importance of uh, sound echoing content, but also um, 
alluding, it seems to me, there the old hackneyed associations of the heroic couplet form that poets like Pope were writing in and which had been kind of gr gradually deteriorating, gradually disintegrating during the Romantics, you know, through the 19th century and then here into the beginning of the 20th century, um, the modernist period, which sought to kind of break down all those, as they saw it, conventions of of poetry and, and one of the most kind of strict, you might say, is is the form of Alexander Pope's poetry, which is very, very kind of dense. Um, but also uh, that during the course of the 18th century, because Alexander Pope's poetry was so popular, it became very kind of cliche to write in heroic couplets. So there's all, there, you know, the swathes of absolutely terrible heroic couplets because it's really easy to write heroic couplets badly um, and that's where you get these kind of hackneyed old hackneyed stereotype um, types of poetry because they're just regurgitating essentially what has gone before um, and they're you know writers like the modernists were seeking to 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 kind of overtly break that down as Lawrence goes on to say, we can break down those artificial conduits and rhyme is one of those for Lawrence or um, to some extent rhyme is one of those artificial conduits and canals through which we do so love to force our utterance. So thinking about this kind of army imagery, I think is useful. It's, you know, the kind of um, sergeant major, not my army <laughs> terms are very good but the kind of army major telling telling the rhythm and the rhyme what to do it being very strict it being very regimented um it being forced it being artificial um and you know seeking something freer something apparently more natural a, a greater kind of expression of of self uh, we can break the stiff neck of habit and obviously rhyme is a kind of habit of poetry we can uh, we can be in ourselves spontaneous and flexible as flame we can see that utterance rushes out without artificial foam or artificial smoothness and again um, those two terms are very much associated with alexander pope artificial uh, and the idea of smoothness, his his poetry was always sort of spoken about as being very smooth. And that's what, you know, uh, that's what uh, poetry apparently ought to be, smooth. Of course, Alexander Pope himself talks about actually that you need smoothness and roughness. Um, and that's the sound echoing the sense. Um, but still, smoothness became associated with the heroic couplet, you know, very tightly rhymed, very artificial uh, in terms of the language that was used to criticize it, um, types of poetry. But we cannot positively prescribe any motion, any rhythm, all the laws we invent or discover. So this is, Lawrence is essentially saying that any laws of poetry that we have are, are just a kind of arbitrary artificial invention. Um, but these are these have failed to be applied to free verse. They will only apply to some form of restricted, limited, unfree verse. All we can say is that free verse does not have the same nature as restricted verse. And going back to comparing the two poems then side by side, I think it's worth pausing on that last uh, quotation. Some form of restricted limited unfree verse so if if free verse is seen as freedom then anything that kind of conforms or is uh, restricted or is limited becomes unfree the kind of restraint um, on or tight form and on tight rhyme and now I want to look at the rhyme within Autumn Rain, because for everything that Lawrence says about uh, unfree uh, and free verse being, you know, much more kind of akin to uh, the expression of the self and so on. Actually, Autumn Rain is a poem that has a very interesting and quite strict 
rhyme scheme. But I think it's interesting to note that the later version, so you might say the, the version that looks visually more like free verse than the earlier version, it's collected in his collected poems under unrhyming poems. So Lawrence thinks of it, collects it as an unrhyming poem. And yet, as we're going to see, actually rhyme plays quite a crucial part within the poem itself. So I think that's an interesting kind of dichotomy to look at and investigate in a little bit more detail. So here is the, the rhyme pattern uh, demarcated. And you can see that actually it's a very contained rhyme scheme because there are no odd ones out. All the rhymes have a pair in this poem. So let's look then in a bit more detail at those rhymes. So the poem starts off with a ABC, ABC rhyme scheme. So the plain leaves fall black and wet on the lawn, the cloud sheaves in heaven's field set, droop and are drawn. So leaves, sheaves, wet, set, lawn, drawn, ABC, ABC. This then is repeated in uh, the, the third and the fourth stanzas. Uh, I'm calling them stanzas, um, but verses you might you might like to call them. Um, and the, the, the pattern is repeated, but it's got new rhymes. So we've got D, E, F, D, E, F. In falling seeds of rain, the seed of heaven on my face, falling I hear again like echoes even that softly pace. Rain, heaven, face, again even pace. In the, the, the fifth and the sixth stanzas, verses, Again, it, there's, a, there's a sort of half shift uh, and half remaining. So uh, it's half the same and it half breaks down. So yes, there's a kind of ABC rhyme, but it's repeated from the first line of the previous two stanzas. So heaven's muffled floor the winds that tread out all the grain of tears the straw harvested in the sheaves of pain so ghd ghd so the first and the fourth rhyme the second and the fifth rhyme and the the third and the sixth rhyme in this sort of mini section follow the same pattern of ABC, but we've got the repetition of the D sound crucially. And the D sound plays a very important role throughout the poem. Um, I mean, for a start, it rhymes with the, the title Autumn Rain, but as you can see, it crops up again and again within the poem. Rain again, grain, pain, slain, pain, rain. Moving on then to the seventh stanza, it's again sort of half different uh, but half the same. So the first line, I, is a new rhyme caught up aloft, but the second two lines within that stanza are a repetition kind of directly of the lines in the previous two stanzas. So the H and the D carry on from the fifth and the sixth stanzas. So there's a sort of emphasis then created by the rhyme in the second and third lines in the seventh stanza. And what I mean by that is we've had this pattern set up of ABC, ABC that's kind of repeated in D, E, F, D, E, F, and then G, H, D, G, H, D. So it's beginning to build an emphasis on the D sound, the D rhyme. And then in the seventh stanza, you've got the repetition again of the D sound as the 
a kind of final um, rhyme that's gone previously in the last two stanzas, but also the H rhyme. I hope that this is making sense. Um, we've got a kind of, so the pattern has been set up in the first six, but then this additional repetition of these two rhymes kind of coming together in the seventh stanza really emphasizes these lines the sheaves of dead men that are slain and you can see why that would be a really important line that you would want to emphasize so the h and the d and the h and the d have been set up in the fifth and the sixth stanza and then they really kind of hit home in the repetition again the kind of additional repetition in the seventh stanza the winds that tread out all the grain harvested in the sheaves of pain the sheaves of dead men that are slain so it's really um hourly emphasizing those rhymes dead and slain so moving on then to the next stanza the first line again uh, echoes the seventh so we've got within the whole poem then the first eight stanzas the first line of each one does have its kind of um, rhyming echo so the first lines do follow a very kind of particular pattern the pairs of opening lines in the stanza so you've got a and a sheaves and leaves d and d rain again g and g floor and store and here again even though it has begun to break down the rhyme scheme to some extent although i'm arguing that actually there's a kind of very particular rhyme pattern that's sort of different from what's expected but emphasizes what it's supposed to emphasize um, and here you've got i i so it's conforming to that pattern in terms of the first line of the, each stanza having its uh, kind of aural echo and we see that then again sort of break down but sort of not in in of all the pain which apparently kind of starts stanza nine um, and then three lines after that you've got that uh, sound repeated again as it has been throughout the rest of the poem so then going back to kind of d d pain rain which is the kind of thought that keeps recurring throughout the whole poem the the kind of association of this rain that's falling on him and he's kind of associating it with the the pain of the men and thinking about these men who've also been harvested so it's very explicitly drawn attention to in that final rhyme which echoes the opening lines in the other eight stanzas in the poem also important thinking about the eighth and the ninth stanza is that the ending returns to the abc abc rhyme except that here so it's a kind of inversion so you open abc abc and then you close here ejd ejd it's broken differently across the stanza and there's a there's a stanza break as you can see after manner invisible but the aural expectation of the listener really remains the same because those kind of stanza breakdowns are much less in this version um, than they were in the earlier one you could say so there's a kind of sense of completion in the way that the rhyme is formed <laughs> the way that it's structured because it opens abc abc and it also closes with that sense of completion too in ejd ejd So we can see actually the importance of rhyme in this poem and i think it's worth drawing on the line like echoes even so echoes 
Well, rhyme is a bit like an echo because you have a kind of sound echo um, and the, the two sort of speak to each other. Something is said and then something kind of responds to it and you can use rhyme to, to do that, like echoes even. So on the one hand, like echoes even is like the rain, the sounds of the rain falling and they fall so kind of continuously that they sound, there's a kind of continuous even patter of that. But I also think like echoes even, it sort of, as this rain is falling kind of continuously, like just like the rain, it, it also suggests the kind of awful regularity of the men falling, of the men that are slain falling, 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 falling with a kind of awful regularity, as if they're kind of trapped in this cycle, this rain, pain, slain, rain, pain, slain, rain, pain, slain. So in that sense, then, the, the rhyme encourages us hourly um, to hear this awful, even echo because the, the speaker can't, is kind of trapped by the, the memory or the, by the thought of these men and this rain and the pain and the slain are kind of rhyming symbols of not being able to escape from it, of being kind of trapped thinking about it. So in that sense then, rhyme as Lawrence was talking about when he was talking about free verse being where freedom is and restricted verse being where freedom is not. Rhyme here can be seen as exposing a lack of freedom. So the lack of freedom, the lack of the ability to escape from the pain and that's the men on the field not being able to escape from this pain of being slain, um, but also the speaker of the rain and the pain and thinking of those that have been slain. So instead of seeing this poem as kind of going against what Lawrence was saying about free verse, because it, it's so uh, it's so structured in its way here, the way that he uses rhyme, actually you can see how the way that Lawrence talks about form and freedom in form adds to our understanding actually of the poem because it is a poem about a lack of freedom, a, a poem about um, being stuck and not able to escape. Thank you so much for listening. I do hope you found it illuminating and interesting. Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel, do please subscribe, hit the thumbs up and do leave any comments that you have down below. I really do love to know what you think. And, you know, I can always respond to something that you have always wanted to know about in future videos. So do leave your thoughts below.